Tonight on Cronkite News, the numbers are in and spring training turned out to be a big success. Find out how many turned out to see the games here in the Valley. Plus, a look at the 18th annual Dragon Boat Festival at Tempe Town Lake. And what Governor Hobbs said this morning about the recent abortion ruling, enacting a near total ban. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Jonah Krell. And I'm Asher Heyer. Thank you for joining us. Cactus League spring training is over and the fans made the most of the season, showing up in unprecedented numbers, Asher. That's right, Jonah. The numbers came out this morning and some teams saw a significant rise in fans. Cronkite News reporter Ben Yates joins us now to take a look, take a look back at this season's attendance. Yeah, guys, big trades, postseason runs, and the D-backs making the World Series. All of these added to the record-breaking attendance numbers for this spring's Cactus League games. Despite some days with poor weather, the Cactus League has again reached attendance numbers not seen since before the pandemic. Texas Rangers, D-backs, and the L.A. Dodgers saw an instantaneous rise in attendance. The Rangers saw a 42% increase in fans due to their World Series win. Couldn't be more proud. They be clearly uh, we have in the Arizona area because Bridget mentioned the Grapefruit League, very disparate, you know, very fractional. Arizona, we got our leadership in the room. We talked about our issues we had, challenges during the uh, pandemic and those three years. I think we're well on our way back. In all, 15 major league teams played in 10 stadiums across the valley. And who knows, maybe we'll see even higher attendance numbers next year. The Diamondbacks are at home tomorrow, facing off against the St. Louis Cardinals after a six-game road trip. The Snakes started off the road trip being swept by the Atlanta Braves and losing their first game against the Rockies. Although it looked like they were going to drop the third game in the series, Eugenio Suarez hit a two-run double in the ninth to put the D-backs up 5-3, securing the W and winning the series 2-1. The D-backs are still without Geraldo Perdomo and Paul Sewald though Alec Thomas is expected to make his return soon. And now from the mound to the circle, college softball is in full swing. Arizona State softball added some new pieces to its roster, including one player who is making her homecoming back to Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Alaya Harriet has more on Tanya Wendell's decision to return home and transfer to ASU. Arizona State softball's Tanya Wendell has made her return to her home state to take the field in front of her family and friends as one of the newest Sun Devils. Wendell is originally from Peoria, Arizona. She played her freshman year collegiately at Utah Tech and then made the decision to enter the transfer portal and come to ASU. It's awesome. Um, I've always dreamed of going here ever since I was little. It was actually my first college softball camp and as soon as I stepped on campus, I knew it was home. So it means a lot to me and, and finally being able to come back. Wendell is no stranger to the Valley, having played high school softball at Cactus under Bart Underwood. Underwood knows Wendell will turn heads at ASU, just like she did in high school. Tanya, as a freshman, made an impact right away because um, she could run. She was really fast, and, and she also hit the ball. She could slap, bunt, or, or swing away. At Utah Tech, Wendell was named WAC Freshman of the Year in the 2023 season and was an all-WAC first-team selection. ASU head coach Megan Bartlett is confident that Wendell is going to continue making her presence known in college softball, now as a Sun Devil. And he's going to be, I think, a special kid in the program. Like, she's going to be one of those, she may break hit records, right? And she's, I think, going to be one of those special players. Like, you're going to remember that name for a long time when she's done. Going into her sophomore year, Wendell wanted to become more aggressive in the box. Coach Bartlett knows Wendell will continue to find her footing. And in the first game of the season for ASU, Wendell started and earned her first career hit as a Sun Devil. As she continues to get reps, right, um, continue to compete at a really high level, we're just excited to watch her go. Because anytime you're not having to, like, you have kids up or dial them down or fix things on kids, it's really just a matter of giving her the right to land a bridge, watching her go. Wendell has already made an instant impact in maroon and gold. And Sun Devil fans are going to hear her name for years to come. In Tempe, Alaya Harriet, Cronkite News. Moving to hockey now, and while the Coyotes are still looking for their den for next season, the NHL regular season is still going on with the Yotes on a five-game road trip. The Yotes were up north facing the Vancouver Canucks and pull off a massive upset. After the Canucks failed to capitalize on a penalty shot, it would be the rookie Logan Cooley with a shorthanded goal. And with all the noise of the Coyotes moving to Salt Lake City, you would think it might impact the team, but yesterday's victory proved otherwise. I think when they were the first rumor about Salt Lake City was 
can tell you exactly the date because it was January 24th and that we were just finishing a four win in the last five games and we went on the on the 14 game losing streak. So we did not manage those distractions really well the first time. So I said it's not everybody who has a second chance. We had a chance to to do better this time. The Yotes return home to Mullet on April 17th for their final game of the season. From the ice to the hardwood, the Suns are now the seventh seed heading into the postseason. After being blown out by the Clippers at home earlier this week, Phoenix went to Los Angeles last night looking for a payback and did just that, blowing out the Clippers 124 to 108. But despite the win, the Suns lost their, their sixth seed after the Pelicans beat the Kings. This means the Suns are now in the playing tournament and Phoenix, Phoenix finish off, will finish off their season on the road facing the Kings tomorrow, then the T-Wolves on Sunday. And Asher, while the Suns were on the road, back here in the Valley, the focus may have been on the Final Four this past weekend, but as Cronkite News reporter Cameron Palmer tells us, there was another game which took place here in the Valley. Historically, black colleges and universities held their third annual HBCU All-Star Game at Grand Canyon University in Phoenix in front of an enthusiastic sold-out crowd. The Final Four in the NCAA and the HBCU All-Star Game happens in the place where the Final Four exists. So I was very happy when I received a call from CBS Sports, the broadcaster partner, to say, can you help the HBCU All-Star Game integrate into Phoenix because there are no HBCUs here. With no HBCUs in Arizona, this allows students from those schools to show off their school spirit to a new audience. See all the HBCU graduates that was in the stand, how, how proud they were and how much fun they had to go have a flashback back to their school days. This event was more than a game to many spectators. It was about representing a culture to be seen throughout the country. It means a whole lot to me. It's, a, it's an event that brings a, a lot, bring the our culture together. This was superb for the culture of not only Phoenix, but the nation got a chance to see black excellence on display. The HBCU All-Star Game will be on display next year in San Antonio. In Phoenix, Cameron Palmer, Cronkite News. Coming up next, the story of Iowa State's 141-pounder, Anthony Echemendia. It makes me so happy to be able to, you know, show, show all the work I've put in. When we come back, we'll look at Echeman Diaz's journey to the NCAA Wrestling Championships. Plus, it's going to be a warm weekend. Your full forecast is coming up next. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications Phoenix Sports Bureau provides students with hands-on learning experiences and opportunities in sports journalism. From covering local high schools, colleges, and the pros, students get the opportunity to go live from our Facebook shows covering local, collegiate, and pro sports in the Valley. From digital reporting, broadcast, social media, and producing, there's opportunities for all. For more, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Welcome back. Dragon boat racing is a water sport that originated in China. It is now practiced all over the world. That's right, Jonah. The Arizona Dragon Boat Association hosted its 18th annual Dragon Boat Festival this year at Tempe Town Lake with races and celebrations of Chinese culture. Dragon boat racing is one of the oldest organized competitions in human history. The sport carries the traditions of an event that occurred in China over 2,000 years ago. Today, the sport celebrates both the competitive and cultural aspects with large community involvement right here in Tempe. Dragon Boat is just not a sport, you know, made for China. It started in China. Their love for their culture, their love for the dragon, that has now inspired the rest of the world. In Chinese culture, the dragon is a symbol of power, strength, and good luck. And for 20 years, the Arizona Dragon Boat Festival has brought in a variety of teams, including collegiate, corporate, youth, and adaptive. The participants of dragon boating are diverse, and the sport welcomes people of all ages and backgrounds. There's the very unique about the sport is that there's age groups like my little brother, for example, he's 13, and I've seen people all the way up to like 85 paddling. So it's a very this sport will keep you very fit, and it's meant for any age. The boats at this festival can hold up to 22 people. 
20 paddlers at the center of the boat, a steers person at the back end of the boat to keep it on course, and a drummer that sits at the head of the boat to keep it on pace. It has brought the community and people into another type of athleticism that's not common that you see now. This team sport requires the precision and synchronization of each individual on the boat to be successful in the race. The colorful event was a huge success, and their hope is to continue to grow the sport one dragon boat at a time. In Tempe, Rebecca Daly, Cronkite News. Dragon boat racing. If you don't know, now you know, right? And it looks entertaining, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's get it in the Olympics next. How about that? <laughs> the Arizona Dragon Boat Association has 10 different teams in their organization that practice weekly at Tempe Town Lake. Well, it would be a beautiful weekend to get out on the water at Tempe Town Lake. Yeah, it's the perfect time, Asher. Let's find out more about the temperatures headed our way. Anthony Remedios joins us here at the desk with the weather forecast. Anthony, what can we expect this week? Yeah, sure. Today we saw the hottest temperatures of the year so far, and we can expect that trend to continue over the next couple of days. Looking at this evening, though, it's getting a warm, beautiful evening here in Arizona. So get out there, enjoy it while you can, while those temperatures are in the 80s. Now, as we get into the summer months here, we're going to see those low temperatures slowly increase. But for tomorrow specifically, mid-60s here in the valley and even approaching the low 30s up north. But the most important thing this weekend is going to be to stay hydrated. We're going to see temperatures in the low to mid-90s across most of southern Arizona this tomorrow, much like what we saw today. And if you're taking a weekend road trip up to the Grand Canyon, a nice, a nice, comfortable 70 degrees. The nice thing is, though, that we're going to see some light to moderate winds tomorrow and Saturday, perfect for offsetting those warm temperatures. And hey, in honor of National Pet Day, what better way to celebrate than taking your dog for a walk? Now, if tomorrow, you're going to want to take your dog out earlier in the day before lunchtime as those temperatures might be a little too hot for your dog's paws in the afternoon. And finally, looking ahead to our full eight-day forecast here, we'll see those temperatures in the 90s through Saturday, just in time for the return of Diamondbacks baseball to Chase Field before those temperatures will trail off on Sunday and throughout most of next week. From the Cronkite Weather Center, I'm Anthony Ramitos. Back to you guys. Thanks, Anthony. Well, it's been a long journey for Iowa State's 141-pounder Anthony Echemendia from fleeing his home country of Cuba to finding a home in Tucson. Yeah, a crazy journey. The wrestlers' perseverance and resilience were on full display at the NCAA Wrestling Championships. Cronkite News reporter Jack Bartlett was in Kansas City, Missouri to get the scoop. From Cuba to seeking asylum in Tucson, Arizona to here in Kansas City. It's been a long journey for Iowa State's 141-pounder Anthony Echemendia and his journey to becoming an All-American. He simply says it's a blessing. It makes me so happy to be able to, you know, show, show all the work I've put in and pay him back for a, for a second chance because that man right there, along with my high school coach and all the, the rest of the coaching staff, they, man, they, they helped me. In 2018, Echemendia was in Guatemala for a wrestling tournament with the Cuban national team when all of a sudden he promptly left the squad in hopes of immigrating to the United States. It took around 20 harrowing days to get to the U.S. traveling through the jungle of Belize and avoiding the Guatemalan police. Since he left Cuba, Echemendia has not seen his parents, but they were blowing up his phone with text during the NCAA tournament to show their support. My parents are driving me crazy. They're in Cuba and they're just texting me, my mom, I'm praying for you. Ah. I'm like, hey, you need to chill on me. Let me stay focused on the tournament, we talk later. You know, his, his father uh, and uh, my, our assistant coach, Coach Fernando Villascuse, uh, grew up, uh, they were kids together, and so that relationship goes way, way back. So Fernando's been like a father figure ever since Anthony came over to the United States about four or five years ago. Echemendia found asylum in Tucson, Arizona, where he wrestled at Sunnyside High School. He says it's the best high school wrestling program in the nation and is grateful for the opportunity afforded by his coaches. I can't really be humble about this because Coach Leon, man, we have the best program in the country. 30-some state titles as a team. The, those guys, man, work really hard. 
And like I said before, they are so good because they not only care about wrestling, they care about you as a person, and that's why they do so well. Besides, they're just extremely good, extremely good uh, coaches and athletes. As a redshirt junior, Echemendia will have the chance to repeat as an All-American and get a chance at a national championship once again. Here in Kansas City, Jack Bartlett, Cronkite News. Just an incredible story. And after a fifth place finish, Echemendia finally has a chance to catch his breath this offseason. And while in Cuba, Echemendia won five national titles and will look to add an NCAA championship to his resume next season. Coming up next, a look at today's top news headlines. Marnie Jordan joins us now from the newsroom with what we can expect. Thanks, Joan and Asher. When we return, a replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, where you can find it right here in the valley and what the memorial means to those in Arizona. ASU's one and only student-run radio station, Blaze Radio, provides students with opportunities to cover a variety of topics. From music, this is Sun City Garage, to sports coverage, against the Brewers in his last outing, he went like, to news, the bill also gives parents the ability to see, and entertainment updates. Blaze Radio offers a fun environment to gain valuable broadcast experience. To find out more, visit blazeradioonline.com. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. Welcome back to Cronkite News. I'm Marnie Jordan, here with your news across Arizona. Following Tuesday's near-total abortion ban ruling in Arizona, Governor Katie Hobbs responded today, discussing what she hopes for Arizona's future. Cronkite News reporter Adriana Gonzalez-Chavez is in downtown Phoenix to share Governor Hobbs' response with us. Earlier this morning, Governor Hobbs held a press conference regarding a new program that will help homeowners in Arizona afford housing. But during this press conference, she was also asked questions regarding abortion. As of right now, Governor Hobbs says that she will not be holding a special session to talk about abortion. If the 1864 ban is repealed, we're still stuck with the 2022 ban. And the bottom line is that these decisions should not be between a, a person who needs health care and the government and politicians. It should be between a woman and her doctor. And that is the ultimate goal right there. Governor Hobbs also said that she's talking with political leaders on both sides about next steps for abortion here in the state. In Phoenix, I'm Adriana Gonzalez Chavez, Cronkite News. The Phoenix police chief has fired an officer after an incident in 2022 where he shot a man who was throwing rocks. Interim Phoenix police chief Michael Sullivan determined Officer Jesse Johnson was out of policy during the fatal shooting of Ali Osman, who was unarmed and turning away, according to court records. This comes after the city already settled a wrongful death lawsuit with Osman's family for $5.5 million. In a statement issued by the Phoenix Law Enforcement, the president said, quote, We are appalled at interim Chief Sullivan's message and his decision to terminate Officer Johnson. This will no doubt have a chilling effect on our membership and their service to the community. The Arizona Game and Fish Department wants to remind the public to keep their pets vaccinated after multiple rabies incidents. 
A gray fox suspected of being rabid bit three people in two separate attacks earlier this month at Saguaro National Park in southern Arizona. Another fox bit someone on Mount Lemmon near Tucson. Both animals were killed. These incidents serve as a reminder to regularly vaccinate pets against rabies and to keep a safe distance from wildlife, especially animals that could be behaving abnormally. A replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is here in the valley. Cronkite News reporter Sydney Whitty went to the opening ceremony of the memorial. Lake Pleasant is one of the 33 stops that the Wall That Heals Memorial will make at sites across the country. Well, the reason I'm at here is today's my birthday, and the gentleman I'm here to see was my friend who uh, was born on April 9th, and he passed away in Vietnam about 24 days before he was to leave. Willis Albert Toombs, one of the many names engraved on the wall that heals. Blonde-headed, blue-eyed kid from the Midwest. Uh, would have been a third generation stonemason for his family. Uh, he uh, probably like most of these young men and women, bubbly, full life ahead of him. Spanning the length of 375 feet and has over 58,000 names of the men and women that lost their lives during the Vietnam War. It's a healing process. Yes. It's, it's a healing process. And while the wall brings up raw emotions and difficult memories, even those who helped organize the memorial recognize the healing it brings to the community. And so the stories that will be shared over the next four days are part of that healing process. And that includes for me because my stepfather, yes, he was shot down and he came home, but he had uh, his, na his aviator in the back of his F4. His name, Andy, is on the wall. And I will, and I will find his name and I, and I will mark it down as well. The memorial's name holds its purpose, to heal. It's just a healing, healing experience to be close to it and see the devastation that took place, so many lives that were taken. The lives of the 58,318 men and women live on through the memorial and serve as a reminder to younger generations about those who made the ultimate sacrifice. This kind of sets it up to where people can uh, see the war has consequences. The memorial is open 24 hours today through Sunday when it closes at 2 p.m. In the newsroom, Sydney Witte, Cronkite News. Arizonans have raised more than $5.3 million for nearly 900 nonprofits in Arizona. It's all part of an annual event called Arizona Gives Day. In the last decade, Arizona Gives has donated nearly $50 million to local nonprofits. It's all organized through the nonprofit advocate AZ Impact for Good. This year, almost 30,000 donations were made, and more than 1,200 volunteers also agreed to contribute nearly 60,000 hours to their favorite nonprofits. That's it for today's news headlines. I'm Marnie Jordan, back to Jonah and Asher. Thanks, Marnie. Well, coming up next, imagine being out sea when a swell damages your boat. Yeah, it sounds like a nightmare, but it really happened to these three mariners. Thankfully, these men were rescued by the U.S. Coast Guard, but wait until you find out how they survived all alone on a deserted island for more than a week. What Concrete News means to me is opportunity. We do news right at Cronkite News, serving a community ethically, honestly, and truthfully. And we can provide a necessarily different angle, different voice for those people that really need it. The students, they have a lot of passion for journalism. I get to do a lot of stories about the Hispanic community. And we have access to cover all of these sorts of events and get media coverage of all these different personalities and athletes, and that's just a huge thing. But it's also a chance for people here to be humanized. Individuals of all walks of life. Cronkite News will help take the next generation of journalists onto their next careers. I am old enough to remember Walter Cronkite. We're putting a lot of pride on his name because we are practicing a lot of the, the things that he did. I think he'd be smiling from ear to ear. I. 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 We are Cronkite.
Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications Phoenix Sports Bureau provides students with hands-on learning experiences and opportunities in sports journalism. From covering local high schools, colleges, and the pros, students get the opportunity to go live from our Facebook shows covering local, collegiate, and pro sports in the Valley. From digital reporting, broadcast, social media, and producing, there's opportunities for all. For more, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Today is National Pet Day, and we want to let you know that the Arizona Humane Society's Healthy Tales Mobile Veterinary Clinic will be on the San Carlos Reservation starting tomorrow. They'll be providing free spay and neuter surgeries and wellness services. Limited appointments are available. This event is only available to San Carlos Reservation members. And finally tonight, three people are lucky to be alive after they were stranded on a remote island. Yeah, that's right, Asher. The three mariners had been lost on the island for more than a week before being rescued by the U.S. Coast Guard. They became so desperate, they actually used palm fronds to spell out help in the hopes someone would see it. And that's just what happened, because the help sign was spotted by a U.S. Navy jet. The men had been fishing in the area when their boat was damaged. They made it to the deserted island and lived off coconut meat and fresh water from a well. Wow, an inspiring story to close. That's it for Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us. And to see top Arizona stories anytime, log on to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.